First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. As Washington and Baltimore prepared for a blizzard, snow and rain made their way into the Carolinas this morning. During a briefing, North Carolina Governor Pat McRoy addressed safety concerns for his state. Uh, the, the issue across the state is very strong gusty winds, which could cause some power outages and uh, again make it difficult for safety personnel. But uh, very, very strong gust wind. This is a primary concern where we're going to have heavy ice again, primarily in the Charlotte region. A storm front evolving into a major blizzard is America's top story tonight. It's Friday, January 22nd. I'm Marie Edinger. And I'm Taylor Trichet. Thanks for joining us. There are no snow worries this far south, but with that bad weather in Charlotte, we're still seeing the ripple effect on air traffic. Evan Moon joins us now in the studio. What can you tell us? Some airports like Philadelphia will already are announcing that they'll be closed tomorrow, but um, with some of the conditions in the Carolinas today, um, the airports were a ghost town. A few hundred travelers were told that their flight plans would have to change. Because of weather conditions in North Carolina, several flights out of Gainesville were canceled. A blizzard threatening to dump two feet of snow from D.C. to New York is canceling flights around the nation. At Gainesville Regional, flights to Charlotte were canceled today. Some travelers still came to the airport trying to find other flight options. I'm going to New Orleans to see my new granddaughter. But Victoria's plans have changed. Yes, I was going to leave at 11 in the morning. Now I'm leaving at 5 a.m. Flights to Miami and Atlanta are the only flights out of Gainesville. With these four main cancellations through American Airlines, there's no need for a TSA agent behind the counter today. This isn't the first nor'easter to affect people in Florida. I mean, a winter storm will do that to a city. If, if the flights are all canceled going into one destination and all of our flights go to that destination, yes, it will impact our, our passenger traffic significantly for that day. But the airport staff doesn't handle the cancellations. American Airlines managed all the switched flights and travelers. The airline let passengers know about the cancellations yesterday. For now, only one flight to Charlotte tomorrow is canceled, but connecting flights to the Northeast are unlikely. Washington, D.C. is the expected bullseye for the storm. More than two and a half feet of snow may fall over the next 36 hours. Thank you, Evan. Now, those storms are affecting North Florida, but we haven't seen any snow just yet. That would certainly <laughs> be a sight to see. WFT's Amanda Holly joins us now from the Weather Center. Amanda, is Snowstorm Jonas going to be affecting us in any ways other than canceled flights? Well, you know, the snow is not quite out of the question tonight, but first, we already saw that strong cold front move through this morning. It brought a line of showers and thunderstorms and some stronger thunderstorms to parts of North Florida this earlier this morning. That's all out of the picture. And after that, we had a pretty nice day. Partly cloudy skies out there, a high of 70 degrees. But that's the last day we're going to have a high of 70 degrees. Temperatures are going to plummet. But check this out really quickly. The areas that you can see, the tiny specks of blue there, those are snow flurries as far south as Valdosta, possibly along the Nature Coast. So that is early, early on your Saturday morning. It's going to be cold, though, for your Saturday. Check out tonight's temperatures, 47 degrees by 2 a.m. Very cold, feeling even colder. Coming up, I'm going to tell you just how cold our Saturday's highs will be. Back to you. Thanks, Amanda. The city and county are thinking about jointly operating Gainesville's Empowerment Center, which includes Grace Marketplace and Dignity Village. They would replace the private company that operates the, the center one. right now. WUFT's Joey Schatt joins us live from the newsroom. Joey, how will they decide if they want to go through with this? They're conducting a study that compares the price of their proposal to the current operation costs. The city and county agree that the costs for Grace Marketplace and Dignity Village have risen and that this needs to be addressed. The Empowerment Center Oversight Board is suggesting that the city operate the maintenance of the facility and that the county operate the services provided on site. The study will determine if doing this would be more cost effective than the center being privately operated. The Coalition for the Homeless and Hungry, run by Teresa Lowe, is currently operating the center. Lowe says it costs them slightly more than $1 million per year and that it's more effective for the center to be privately operated. As a nonprofit, we can make changes quickly. If something isn't working, I can change it today. I don't have to 
notice it and have three meetings to before I can, can change it or purchase something or, or whatever. If the city and county decide to operate Grace Marketplace due to the rising costs, then members of the Coalition for the Homeless and Hungry could possibly be forced out of Grace. A main issue being studied is how much it would cost to train local government to operate a shelter like this. Ideas like this one have succeeded in places such as Pinellas County and local government took note. I mean the scale that we're jumping up to with this endeavor is just go so far beyond what the city and the county have supported in the past. But we're seeing that as a national trend too. Some residents of the shelter are even in support of the idea. And they'll be able to provide more services, more staff members, and a better services for the residents that live here. Lowe says she is confident that the study will prove that the private operation is the most effective, but believes there will be findings to help the center be more cost efficient. The city and county have started the study and they expect to release the results in June or July. Reporting live from the newsroom, Joey Schott, WUFT News. Thanks, Joey. A fight after bars closed last night led to shots being fired at a downtown Gainesville parking garage. Police say one man pulled a handgun from his vehicle and fired three rounds into the ceiling. A Gainesville police officer was in the garage at the time and responded as soon as he heard the gunshots area, you're going to have fights, especially when there's alcohol involved. You're going to have fights and you're going to have altercations. Thankfully, uh, downtown Gainesville is a safe place because we do not respond to too many calls where weapons are involved. Charged with assault, battery, and firing a weapon in a public place. Police charged his friend, Philip Van Orden, with trying to hide the gun. Alachua County Commissioners say they're determined to pass a living wage ordinance more people can count on. It won't affect all workers like a minimum wage requirement would, but a new standard set for county employees would carry over to some of the people working for businesses that land county contracts. As Zoe Hogan reports, advocates are pleased with the solidarity shown at a county commissioner retreat. Alachua County Commissioners unanimously decided to alter and rewrite an old ordinance as a new one. They want to hustle through a requirement that contractors match the new lowest wage for the county's direct employees, $12 per hour. You know, if you want to do business with the county, it could be something that you have to pay your employees X number or, or you, won't be, um, you won't qualify for, the, for that particular contract. While the retreat began as a discussion, it ended as an agreement, which took some people by surprise. Today I thought that it was just going to be a discussion. I didn't think there was going to be any action actually taken uh, today, which is good. You know, we, we now know uh, March 8th they're going to come back with an ordinance and uh, we're going to be there to tell them what's good and what's bad about it. Now that the Alachua County Commission has decided that they will pass a living wage ordinance, the question that needs to be answered is how they're going to go about it. The, the biggest issue is, um, are we going to create an ordinance that provides exemptions uh, or are we going to just create an ordinance? And um, that's an important issue because oftentimes in other areas, um, companies would, may use the exemptions to actually not pay a living wage, which goes against the actual philosophy of why we're doing this. The ordinance was originally proposed by Commissioner Cornell towards the end of last year. Zoe Haugen, WUFT News. Some say the city of Gainesville's current living wage ordinance proved to have too many exemptions. County commissioners will have to work through the details of what exemptions, if any, will be allowed for the contractors in the new version. Today marks the 43rd anniversary of Roe v. Wade. The annual March for Life took place despite a major storm and state of emergency in Washington, D.C. The 1973 Roe v. Wade case established the right to an abortion as a constitutional right. The theme for the March for life this year was pro-life and pro-women go hand in hand. The rally began at noon and drew thousands. And GOP contender Carly Fiorina also made a stop at the event. Young adults entering the college system have a lot of things to think about before their first day of school. But WUFT's Ashlyn Reese reports on a new $1.1 million grant that will give some students some financial stability. Before coming to the University of Florida, first-generation student Kyle Jackson didn't know what to expect. Although his parents were very supportive, they didn't have the same advice as parents who attended college themselves. First-generation students, you know, their parents didn't really go to college, so they, you know, their parents aren't doctors and lawyers and whatnot. This five-year grant received by the University of Florida's Office of Academic Support is expected to fund at least 140 first-generation students per year. You know, like our parents really didn't go to college, and we have to, you know, get money from somewhere, and then that grant helps out a lot. 
There are scholarships provided to students like these now, but this money will help reach more students. And students who are from low income or disadvantaged background, whether it's socially, economically, don't graduate at the same rate as um, their non-disadvantaged students, if you will. Since the graduation rate among low-income, disabled, and first-generation students is lower than the average students, the grant targets these young adults. First-generation students walk through U.S. Plaza of Americas every day. With the help of this grant, it can help provide those students with more financial and academic resources that they'll need to graduate. The grant will supply academic advising, a free textbook resource library, and career counseling for first-generation students. So if they have a career uh, counselor, they can have someone to go to, um, ask for advice, you know, what career should I choose. Jackson already has a scholarship from the University of Florida, but says this grant will help more people like him. Ashlyn Reese, WUFT News. The grant was provided to the University of Florida by the U.S. Department of Education. Students will be selected using their applications for student financial aid. WUFT News First at Five is just getting started. Coming up, it's the end of an era for one local restaurant. We'll tell you about how a local favorite lives on after its founder has passed. Plus, our entertainment reporter tried her hand at the circus, but was kind enough to come back to work. Those stories and more coming up after the break. And we started off today rather rainy with a strong cold front that moved through, but uh, temperatures were warm. That's not going to be the story for much longer as much colder air filters into north central Florida. Coming up, I will tell you just how cold it will be on Saturday.